Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me and uh, my guest on Shaw Studio, our first panel um, discussion. And um, sorry, my intro actually is welcome to Shaw Studio Live panel discussions. In these discussions, experts from all part of the industry discuss and debate the most important fashion week shows of the season. Today, in the midst of Milan's men's fashion, um, we're going to be discussing Sylvia Venturi Fendi's show for Fendi, um, uh, Autumn Winter 2021. So I will let my guests introduce themselves, um, starting with uh, Mandy. Hi, my name is Mandy Leonard, and I'm the founder of creative consultancy, Mandy's Basement. I'm a fashion consultant, events organizer, and writer. Thank you. Hi, my name's Lee Goldup. I'm the men's ready to wear buyer at Brands. Thank you, Lee. Hi, I'm Yola Lewis Edwards. I am the director of High Fashion Talk. Thank you. My name is William Detira, um, better known as William Colt on Instagram. I am a creative consultant and um, a consulting editor at Fantastic Men, the men's magazine. So let's look at the Fanny show, um, which one of the, what was one of the physical um, kind of show, physical in the sense of that we had the usual structure of models, set design, but no audience, obviously because of um, health reasons. Um, the season, I think for me, the set reminded me of um, a Bruce no Newman, Bruce Norman, uh, the American artist who uses neon lights as, a, as his kind of um, art form in terms of installation. I don't know if the person in charge of references would have some images of Bruce Newman um, um, installations, but uh, he's someone who uses neon lighting uh, in, in a way to discuss really serious things. Um, and she kind of did a similar thing for me where she used a really happy set, but the whole idea of her show was questioning what is normal. What did everybody think of the set design? To beginning with the set design. Mandy? I like, the, I like the flexibility. I think that the whole thing that we've all had to become accustomed to is agility. And um, as the show progressed, it, it transformed, the lighting transformed. So when the green outfit came out, the green lighting came on. I mean, it wasn't as literal as that, but for example, when the pink shantung silk um, padded coats came out, it went pink, but then there was like a, a wash of yellow coming through as well. And I just thought it was very clever because it, it went from bright saturated color to almost like an in-between, not, not pastel, but there was an in-between and then there was more usual neon lighting. So it started on the neon lighting, a plain color. But I think when you're a set designer, the real cliche thing to do is put one of those, what are they called? Those LED lights, the really long ones. Yeah, I think it's very cliche to do that, but it kind of worked because there was this kind of infinity of the set and it opened up with Sylvia's voice. And then you had all the models coming out, going left, right, center. Some of them were walking through these door-like perimeter structures with the neons and some weren't. Um, and it was almost like this army had arrived. Um, but yeah, I thought it was great because it was adaptable. I like the agility of it and it, and it, it subtly changed between stories. Yeah, I mean, for me, the, the, the question has been, how do we think a fashion show and people have gone from creating films to uh, having these shows without an audience. And I think one of the six successful thing has been for me, the show without audience, where you don't really have to worry about the seating plan, and you worry about the narrative, but you keep the, the, the format of models coming in and out to keep that dynamic. Um, same with Celine and Saint Laurent in the desert. Celine on a racetrack. I think that was th those were a good compromise between the fashion show that everybody's sort of questioning what should it be and creating content online, which sometimes can feel like content and not really a show. We've got an example of the Saint Laurent show in the desert, um, which I think for me was uh, was and and Prada with the cameras last season for women's wear. I really like that they find a compromise between keeping what a show is, which is models in clothing walking out and um, 
uh, you know, just creating something that's digitally interesting for people to watch from home, obviously, from uh, lockdown. Yolo, what did you think? What do you think of the new model for, for what do you think of shows? And Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting to look at how people actually want to see these clothes move. Um, even on TikTok, which I've kind of delved into recently, um, you see a lot of people showing their outfits and sort of pretending to walk even just to show the movement of clothing. Um, and that's really important to this generation. Also, I thought the the lighting in the set, it sort of had a duality also, I think, to the, I don't know if you've seen, but everybody on TikTok now is having LEDs put all around the like roof of the room. And then they change those to kind of go with the mood of whatever fit pick they're taking at the time. Um, so I thought maybe Sylvia had kind of seen that on TikTok, maybe from one of her daughters or something. Um, and that had kind of like made it over into the show. Well, so, so she's kind of made herself relevant to uh, Jen, the millennial and the TikTok audience, which is good. Um, and for you, Lee, what do you think from a bias point of view? I mean, you go to shows, the fact that, you know, how, what, what, what's it like from, from your um, side of the business? I mean, it's different, obviously, you know, having to sit and do it from your, from your house. But um, I thought this was one of, one of the better ones that I've seen, actually, to be honest. I thought it was executed really, really well. Um, I think the music fit perfectly with it as well. I you know, really enjoyed watching it. Yeah. Talking about the music, uh, obviously, one of the highlights in was in the press release is the fact that she's recorded um, music with Michelle Gobert and Norwave. And uh, it's her voice, um, leaving a voicemail, I think, which I thought was really quaint because, I mean, voicemail in 2021, I don't know. Uh, some, some people don't leave them anymore, but it was really interesting to do the voicemail that she did, um, questioning what is normality and use that as her, as her, her, her voiceover for, for the music for the show. Um, some magazines, I mean, some online uh, magazines have written about the fact that, you know, she's released music, she's now a music maker, she can add that to a CV. It reminded me of Jean-Paul Gaultier in 1989, who released um, uh, a music video and, uh, and uh, um, I think a record. I think it was the record at that point, and there's a music video, if anybody wants you to check that out. So it's quite interesting, like, you know, um, designers going into the music business it's quite it's quite fun to think about yeah the the, the reference image is up and the video is amazing if, if you haven't seen it i think it's it's pure jean-paul gautier 90s and it's really great um, you know, what's, what? what's funny is that this song has kind of come back on tiktok as well not to oh, have really one okay TikTok, but the the gen z have really taken an interest in Jean-Paul Gaultier and also using this song as like their background. Okay. Yeah, so I wonder if she's been on TikTok over Christmas or something. <laughs> Possibly. Um, what, what are you guys, what are you guys thoughts on, on, on the music, Mandy and Lee? I found Nico Vassilari as a choice um, uh, who created the music. Um, very interesting. I, mean, I know she still worked with Michael Gober. I think he might have been the one that fries the yeah. word out of her. But what I find fascinating about him is that he's into very analog electronics. And I thought there was a, a good parallel. Sorry to keep using the word parallel. But um, the idea that this was a very slick collection, very minimal. It had a hint of future, futurism about it. Yet... Um, when the um, graphic intarsia stuff came came through in the collection, it was it was quite analog. It was very scribble, so it had a very low key vibe, you know, low low fi vibe about it. And I, and I think there was a, a nice parallel there, and um, it had kind of had this energetic optimism about it. So I think it, it's all these subtle cues, isn't it, that that make it's the sum of all the parts. And I think. I, I'm a kind of really big believer in the casting, the music, you know, everything coming together. And I, I found that really interesting. I wasn't familiar with him before, but I read up about him in, in advance of this. And, you know, he did this project uh, where he curated um, archive cassettes, actual cassette, you know, cassette tapes um, to create new music. And I, and I just think that's great because in a way with the collection, you get, 
you know, it's all about the new normal. So you're going back to what normal was, but actually none of us in fashion want to go back. We want to go forward. So there was almost this futurism about it, but a comforting side with all the kind of duvet and padding and what have you. So there was a nice parallel there for me. Yeah. Lee, what were your yeah, thoughts? I, I love the music to the show personally. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I, I wasn't familiar with the artist either and I was kind of reading up about it myself a couple of hours ago. Um, but I thought the soundtrack was excellent, yeah. And it fit yeah. so well with the set and everything. It just gave it such a good sort of energetic vibe. Um, yeah, there was just such an energy to the show in general, I thought, you know, that it's really sort of optimistic, as you said there, Mandy. It just, I don't know, there's just a real, I love the energy to it. Yeah. Um, so I'm sort of breaking down the show before we talk about the clothes. Um, lastly, for me, was the casting and how different um, it was from the previous show, which was uh, Women's Wear, Men's Wear. And she had kind of really diverse um, casting for the previous show, which was for spring, summer 2020. She had, I think, all ages. She had supermodels from the 90s. She had uh, plus size um, women. Now with menswear, she's going back to um, kind of a younger audience and customer. It's almost similar to the, the kind of younger customer that Dior, Kim Jones and Dior um, is courting. And it, it feels more, you know, Gen Z and end of tell um, millennials. Um, sort of like young millennials, uh, Gen Z kind of design, which is the customer that came in and saved menswear for me to some extent. They're making it less stuffy because, you know, they look at streetwear, they look, but in a, in a, in a kind of luxury uh, and, and, and with better, ta better tailoring. Um, what I find for me with the casting and left me with a question and I want to put it to you guys, is she had plus size women and I've been thinking of plus size men on the ramp. We've had that with Walter Burn, uh, van Berndonk, but is it something that you guys would see or wish would happen more on, on, on with luxury brands to have the plus size men? Because we've had the plus size women, um, you know, for female. And I, obviously women are under a lot more pressure in terms of media for body and, um, you know, body positivity. Uh, do you think body positivity and plus size male is, is, is an idea in terms of casting. Yeah, I think so, for sure. Definitely. It's something, you, you know, that you don't really see at all. It's something I, I've certainly not really seen. Uh, and as you know, to your point, you've seen it a lot more in women's wear for the last few seasons. Yeah. I think it'd be positive on the men's runway as well. Okay. Um, anybody you can think of, Mandy, that might have used uh, plus size men in their shows in London? Because London is always pushing the boundaries. Because I'm, I'm kind of... I can't think off cast, um, but I, I I kind of liked the casting because it was diverse, but it was it wasn't drawing attention to it through uh, having a an old guy or having a you know an oversized size model, and you know like the Chanel show this spring was just I thought it was just hideous how they had one outsized model and it got so much press and the press message was oh isn't Chanel great did a plus one it had one model in like their whole show they had one model so for me that translates to gimmick yeah. so I think that this collection showed a lot of confidence because it was very minimal so so I you know it wasn't trying to be all things to all people which I thought showed restraint and for me that translates to confidence yeah yeah it's not about ticking boxes basically it's it's a, it's a lot more authentic and genuine um in, in terms of casting and it, it, it fits the... the casting wasn't overthought she wanted those clothes look best they could she had a that she ticked all the diversity boxes fine um and, and and we could concentrate on the clothes rather than the models actually yeah 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 uh Iolo, any thoughts on casting i think the collection was all about sort of optimism and looking forward to the future um, so it kind of made sense to go for that sort of youthful, um, they look very young, um, young men that would be sort of going out on the town, going out to clubs, but can't at the moment. 
Um, so I think there is something to be said for casting for the narrative that you're trying to tell. Um, and I think having done what she did last season, she, she was okay to do it this season. Um, of course, whilst keeping an eye on uh, racial diversity and all those sort of political and moral things. And uh, lastly, let's talk about the reference uh, before we jump into the close. Um, obviously, the, the, the big reference and collaboration of the season is no, no Fielding. The British, um, I mean, he does everything from, you know, the baking show to, I mean, he's an artist. He's, um, he is a, I mean, the Mighty Bush. So that was, I think, his TV show. I think he wrote that. Uh, I mean, he's an all-rounder, and his personal style is pretty amazing as a person. Um, yeah, I'd like to ask Mandy a little bit about Noel and what you think of the collaboration. Were you surprised? Yeah, when I saw it, I thought, is this a wind-up? Better check before I post anything. Um, yeah. Like, I'm, I'm sure, a lot of people. And, um, I mean, I know him from hanging around with Peaches Geldof back in the day. They were pals, and I always saw them at events together. And he is a cool, he is a cool guy. I completely respect him. I, I've never watched The Mighty Boosh and I watched Great Bake Off, but um, but it was just hilarious. And and there was a lot of gossip about, oh, I wonder if Kim Jones whispered in her ear about him as a suggestion. I don't know about that. Um, but it came across great because it had a naivety, it was random, it had an analog feel because there was a scribble quality to it. Um, and I, and I, I think it was brilliant. And in, in a way, I don't think the fact that he's well known in the UK needs to come into it. If no one knew who he was and no one picked up on it in the press, it's still cool. So that's yeah. the testament to the, the talent, I think. Yeah. Yeah, he's, I totally agree. The style of drawing an art is really, you know, it's full of energy and it's really exciting and a childlike. And you know, as you, as you said, it's 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 he doesn't need the fame and, and all the achievement attached to it. Just just his art is interesting. Um, yeah. Collaborative it, work. I love the fact that his debut in this maison fashion scene is look twenty three. That coat. Yes. You know, it's almost like that. It landed with a bang. I quite like that. <laughs> I'm still um, I'm still laughing about it, but you know, good heartedly. <laughs> And uh, for you, Yolo? Yeah, I was actually talking to, well, talking digitally to Cosette McCreary, and we were wondering whether it was uh, Ganyo who styled it. Um, he's a bit of an Anglophile, or so I believe. Um, I was wondering whether he kind of remembered Noel from his teens, or whether Sylvia is a big fan of Bake Off. <laughs> Wasn't the last collection, didn't, wasn't there reference to sort of baking for the family or something in that? So, I, I don't I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure on that one. <laughs> but I I thought the same. I thought is it Kim Jones was whispered in her ear? Is it uh Ganyo? Uh obviously because he's London based and you know would know those artists. And I think uh, I read somewhere that she collaborated with um the illustrator Booth. Um is it Michael John Booth? John Booth. John Booth, John Booth. yeah. Uh, with John Booth. So it's quite London-centric, some of the choices that she makes instead and, of these and huge Tilly. artists. And the artist Sue Tilly, who lives in St Leonard's on Sea now, but Sue Tilly yeah. did those lovely, na again, naive graphics all over yeah. everything a couple of seasons ago. But I, I, I reckon it is Julian. What do you think? I think as well. I think, I think it's I think Julian. He's a really cool stylist, and I love the fact that there's continuity with him. And... Uh, and when you have continuity, there's trust. So, for example, you can see that Kim Jones has, is getting off on the fact that he's enjoying this new relationship with Sylvia and Delphina Delatres is her daughter. Yeah. So um, I think when you have trust, it's almost like that's when you can present ideas. And so it must be really nice for someone like Julian, who's got the relationship with him, who's a really good stylist, to come and present these these, these ideas. I, I would imagine it was him. And for you, Lee, do you think it translated in a commercially in terms of design? Is it something that would be for Browns? Like Definitely, yeah. I thought this coat was amazing this, when this, this first came out. I mean, I liked a lot of the other pieces as well, like particularly like the little tank top, the beige one. Yeah. Um, but I thought this coat was incredible and, and this piece here as well with the scribblings on. 
because they are just scribbled. That's what's so nice about it. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. The other thing that I like as well is when an artist collaborates and, and, and sort of works with the logo and uh, the branding of, 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 I mean, it happens often with Kim Jones and, um, and Duo with so Surayama, just, you know, redesigning the Duo logo. So it's always interesting when they get really involved with uh, the design as opposed to just, you know, being plastered on a handbag and it looks like something you would pick up from a museum shop. Uh, it's really nice when it's an actual collaboration. Do you guys think that art collaborations are getting too much? Because there's been one of the discussions online for in social media, people saying it's becoming too much of a, 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 a kind of, a, um, how would I put it? When designers can't be bothered designing, then they just do an art collaboration and it's just, it's a cop out in terms of design. So do you guys think it's, it's reaching that point or not? Not for me personally. I think e even here, it's not like all the collections about, do you know what I mean? There's so much more going on other than this. Um, and if this isn't for you, there's so much more to buy into. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't even think it overpowers the collection at all, really. It's just a nice little kind of snippet in the middle. And you, Yolo, what do you think of uh, art collaborations? Yeah, it's definitely uh, a criticism that's brought up a lot of the time in high fashion talk when, when you have constant collapse and it's hard to catch up. But I do think if somebody likes the artist that is collaborating, then they're all for it. And these collabs are not for the sort of general consumer, but they are a, a special project targeted towards those fans of the artist. Um, is it a crutch to design on? Um, I don't know, but I think designers tend to need something to sort of stimulate them and they can't really go over and over the house codes over and over. Um, so might as well bring in an artist and sort of give them the platform as well to enhance them, like Kim did with them. Um, oh, I'm terrible with names, but the African artist. Yes. Um, I'll be, I'll tell you now. But yes, I see which one, the previous one. It's uh, Amo, Amoako Baofa, and he's based in Accra, Ghana. He was born there, and he's based in Austria. Absolutely. Yeah. And just to sort of platform that artist um, and to share the limelight, um, I think it's a great opportunity for everybody involved. Yeah. I mean, I've heard people that say, you know, they they learn uh, of those artists through the brands. Um, you know, they wouldn't know who Kenny Scharf is without Dior. They wouldn't know who uh, Noel Fielding uh, as an artist is without Fendi. So it is a bit of an art history. Yes, Mandy? I I am a big Kenny Scharf fan. I've been to his okay. exhibitions all over the world. And I made the big faux pas when Kim was collaborating with him earlier this year. When I tagged him on Instagram, I did Kenny Shafter, someone else I follow. And Kenny Sharp took, you know, took a, a, the mickey out of me by saying, oh, here we go. And I had to send him personal messages saying, hey, I'm your biggest fan. You must remember from the Colette blog. I always blogged about you. Don't treat me like some light, you know, someone who doesn't get it. I get it. It was a mistake. Um, <laughs> I, I, I love these. I don't call them collaborations. I call them collisions. Because, um, you know, in this industry, there's nothing more pure and beautiful than collaboration. Because you step back with the, from the results and you think, oh, my God, I could never have done that without him. And it's a little bit about like this collection, you know, um, there's some very, um, you know, like camel and neutrals in this collection. But then imagine that collection without all the charcoal and camel. It needs a foil. And in a yeah. way, you know, you've got this synergy. So those colors and jewels, they wouldn't look as beautiful without all the camel and the charcoal kind of juxtaposition yeah. with them. So yeah. I don't know where I'm going with this, but I, I, I'm a big believer in collaboration. And, and, you know, some collaborations don't come off, but a collaboration should never be gratuitous. You know, where you've collaborated with someone for the wrong reason, you know, for the gimmick. Um, I think a collaboration with like-minded, it's a collision and, and, and it's wrongness. And I love the, the risk of what fruits that can bear. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you. If it's a conversation and obviously 
a, a collision, the way you put it, and something new is born out of it, it those things become really special. You know, owning, uh, you know, a Sprouse LV bag, I still want one. Um, you know, Julie Verhoeven for Louis Vuitton and Marc Jacobs. I, I'm still after that. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it's special objects. The fact that, you know, they work with an artist and they create a it, knit. It's, or... it's so funny you should say that because one of the collaborations with Fendi that I think, dare I say, didn't work is the Porter and Fendi. Because I remember going in the store, I couldn't believe, oh my God, Fendi is collaborating with Porter. This is like historic. And what people in luxury fashion don't realize, I mean, I'm sure that a lot of you guys get it because we've got that Japanese streetwear sensibility, is that Porter is the same quality as a Maison. It is on equal footing with Hermes, Fendi, Louis Vuitton. But the customer who goes to Fendi, the general customer, doesn't give a shit about Porter. So I remember going in the store and saying, have you got the collaboration? And none of the staff knew. And they had it in the store, but none of the staff got it. They didn't even know about it. Obviously, the- but They wouldn't really talk about it. They couldn't get people it, excited. It. it was almost like so far off that luxury global customer walking in, doing luxury shopping. And it was just really shocking to me because I thought, oh my God, this is like amazing, Fendi, the, the Porter collaboration. So it, it's funny, isn't it? But it, it just, I think that leads us to the hype beast issue because in that show, you know, when you're online shopping, um, you know, when you go onto a Maison website uh, like Fendi, there's always a section which is small leather goods and that can encompass tech, accessories you know whatever and I thought that the little um wallet or the pouch that they wore around their neck very minimal very unassuming but with this with the ff what the carl designed for the house um for the hype beast that is completely satisfying um the gimmicky side the kind of hype beast side of things so but what I love about the collection most is it wasn't trying to tick boxes. That just hap that is happens to be the byproduct. Yeah, I yeah. mean, talking about boxes and accessories, obviously uh, Fendi is very much about accessories. She created the first Fendi baguette. Um, for me, let's talk about the baguette. Um, it's kind of, it's another weird thing. It, the saddle by John Galliano and the baguette were things that I saw in magazines growing up, but obviously couldn't afford and obviously wanted. And I find it's amazing that they're bringing it back for men, actually making it for guys to have a version of that design. It um, works. And it works. It totally works, yeah. yeah. Um, actually, so the, the baguette, um, the first stock is was Brown's. Um, uh, in the in the nineties, and um, uh, no, not many people know this, but the baguette obviously it's the very narrow rectangular bag, but yeah. there was a bigger size. But the purists didn't want to know about the bigger size, and also there was, dare I say, affordable baguette. There was a denim baguette, and I remember I got I got the denim one, and it was much less expensive. Obviously, with my store discount, it wasn't. It was much less expensive. But there was a bigger one, and I always regretted not getting the bigger one. But this men's one, I think it takes us into the territory of women wearing men's brands. Because if I was going to buy a, a Fendi baguette, I don't want this little restrictive icon. I want the men's one. And I think it really works as a kind of modern progressive bag shape. And it's, and it's also, it's less structured. It, I think that in this collection, there was soft tailoring, soft structuring, a lot of shirling. Did you see the shirling bag with the yes. F logo all over? It's beautiful, really beautiful. I mean, that, I imagine that actually is really incredibly expensive, um, but it had this easiness about it. I think um, Chloe Street in the Evening Standard made it. Oh no, it was, um, I can't remember his name. The guy who does the reviews for Vogue Runway. He said it was from um, Living Room to Bodega. Yeah. Almost like the idea that you're sitting in your, your living space and you're going to bed or you're moving around your apartment because some a lot of people aren't going out, which leads me on to the yeah. fact that 
I know a lot of friends, I've been going out every day, but a lot of friends are too scared. They are literally have not been out at all. And this collection is very cocooning. It's very safe. Yeah. And it's almost like equipping you with what you need to face the world, please God, post lockdown. Yeah, super I, cozy. Yeah, I, I agree. It's the coziest collection I've seen. And it's kind of, yet it's chic. It's a sort of thing you would, you know, wear, um, how would I put it? She called that collection a kind of a transition between going back into a full active life. So it's being caught between, um, you know, quarantine and, and lockdowns and uh, a, a full active life of, of how people used to, to, to be in, in terms of like going from, you know, the office and parties and dinners, et cetera, et cetera. So this one is kind of the transition, what we would be wearing in 2021 kind of go, going back towards normal, which I'm not really sure what's normal. I agree with the question. I'm not sure about what's normal. Uh, but yes, I, I love that feeling of cocooning and the, the jackets and the soft tailoring in that sense. Lee, what did you think in terms of the collection the, the, for stores and for customers? I think there was plenty to go at for sure, you know, from a buyer's perspective. Um, there's a lot of different things going on. You know, you could, you could go down the route of the, the artist collab part. You could take it a bit more minimal. Uh, you could go for the big kind of puffy, oversized kind of dressing gown type coat. Um, talking about that cozy stuff, you could, you know, you could take it that way. Um, you could buy it in black and gray or you could go for it in the pinks and greens. Um, there's tons of stuff to go at, I think. From a buyer's and perspective. You know, your law? I mean, did you see anything on your wish list? Yeah, I think a lot of it felt like clothes that you'd kind of want to get dressed up in because everybody wants to kind of get over the misery of 2020 and, and get dressed up now. Um, so all these bright colours are amazing, but still give you that comfort. Um, so yeah, a lot of it, even like the shoes, they, they're kind of like slippers, um, which... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love how comfortable and sort of comforting this collection will be. Um, and there's so many, it's interesting how they've managed to do tailoring, but make it soft, which is a huge trend, I think in Milan for the last few days as well, from Xenia and um, Raf's Prada today. Um, yeah, I, I think this is the first time in ages, except for the last combined one that I, I could say, I like everything in this collection. No, same here. Um, now, in terms of uh, Milan, let's talk about cities. Um, I've been having a feeling that, for me, that Italy at the moment is kind of a huge driving force in terms of brands and creativity. It's kind of having its moment um, between, you know, uh, Milan, Rome, uh, brands like Gucci, Fendi, uh, who else? Versace, the last collection, the woman's wear, the Under the Sea was amazing. I think like Italy is sort of, for me, really exciting um, at the moment. What do you guys think in terms of cities and fashion week and all the change of calendars and, you know, let's talk about fashion between cities. I think, I think the biggest irony, and I'm sure you'll all agree, is the fact that they're calling these fashion weeks fashion weeks, whereas actually the way that we're all computing and digesting fashion week it's like what is the point of fashion week in different cities because it's all online it's all global yeah. so the big irony there for me yeah why are we dividing it by cities when actual fact that you're right um the, 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 it's more of an international i mean it's more of a it's happening online, like you said, yeah. I remember um, years ago, um, I was working with Pitti Romo and they wanted me to do something at Milan Fashion Week or bring something. They were gonna pay for us to bring a designer over. And it, it just seemed like such an obvious thing to do, bring a, bring a cool designer and make it cool. It was almost like that's too easy. So I said, why don't we bring Boombox over? And then you'll get all the designers as part of that. So we brought over Giles and we gave them all, so we did a boombox party. And I remember Katie Ground was at a Dolce & Gabbana dinner just before. And Susie Menkes went over to Katie's table and said, I hear you can get me into boombox. And um, all the designers bought two guests. 
and um, each of their guests wore the clothing and we gave each of the designers a role. So Giles was the coat check, Roxanda Ilinchich was the cigarette girl, not very appropriate now. Um, Gareth Pugh had a cocktail bar, so behind the bar there was a certain cocktail bit that he did. Everyone had a role. And the thing was, dare I say, Milan was a little bit boring back then. So the fact that we did that in Milan, it was really great. And we got loads of traction. Um, and, and yeah, it, it was just brilliant. But now it's almost like, I think we're harking back to the finesse of these fashion weeks because traditionally Paris is the filter you have to go through to get onto the global platform. So you show in London, great, really cool. Um, but when you actually show in Paris, you're going through this global portal, whereas actually you forget about the power of Milan because out of all the fashion weeks, Milan is the one where all the deals went on, where all the dinners happened, where people negotiated pages of magazines. I mean, I know the landscape of that is all changing, but Milan has got this, this incredible legacy. And I, and I think that, you know, Raf with Prada, Fendi, these are all brilliant um, cornerstones that are re-emerging and, and, and giving us this finesse because at the end of the day, everyone's sick of hype beast. Everyone's sick of drops and limited edition. They I think all these young kids want to be uh, thought of that they can digest finesse. You know, they can appreciate uh, elegance. I agree with you. And I think for me, this is what makes Kim Jones really strong and what he's doing at Dior and what he might be doing um, by, you know, being involved with Fendi is he's really teaching a new generation of guys about menswear and to move away from hype beast and that whole, um, you know, they grew up with, 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 you know, drops and Supreme, et cetera, et cetera. But they, they sort of, they're growing up and they're taking an interest in, in fashion. Um, you know, teaching them about quality, the right fabrics, cats, um, you know, refreshing what menswear is, but making it refined, the, 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 the way you describe it. And I think he's doing an amazing job in that sense, um, in teaching a whole new generation how to dress. Um, right. Uh, does anybody have any looks that stand out and would like to discuss and pull up from the show? For me, I, I have the, which look? I think the opening look, look number one with the collars. Yeah, that's really nice. The long collar, those, I mean, that's an amazing one. And I think it's so interesting, the long collar, um, the knitted um, collar. Uh, and it's, it's, I think for me, the day you've got design as a question, because the question is what is normal? And she's just done this kind of crazy collar. Um, which asked the question, what is normal? The color, which is a sleeve at the same time. Um, do you have any looks you guys would like to discuss, like specific looks for the show before we wrap up? Because I think we've done um, 45 minutes so far with the conversation. I, I, I actually quite like look five. I, I was really paired back and simple and, and it's one of the, you know, the easiest looks in a way. But I actually really like that with that sort of utility vibe to it. It's not one of the standout looks, but it was one that I actually really liked. Yeah, that's a beautiful one. And shorts in winter with thick socks is really interesting as well. But yeah. then again, she's asking the question, what is normal? Um, but it's really beautiful. I, Yolo, do you have any looks? Or Mandy, do you have any looks that you yeah. want to highlight? Yeah. Yolo? Oh, you go first. I'll, I'll... Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> for me, I thought that the flat front men's trousers, which are very slim with the stay crease, were just amazing. They were so minimal, but there was such a look. And I also think that when we talk about sustainability, um, you know, in lockdown, I think we've all made little frivolous, inexpensive purchases just to keep our hand in. Whereas actually, as lockdown has progressed, we all feel a bit sick that we've bought all this nothing, as it were, little gimmicks. Yeah. And, and when I see that collection, I imagine that, you know, someone who, you know, is sick of all the drop and the hype beast stuff, you know, this is a fantastic cornerstone purchase to just enliven a new season. It goes with everything you've got. You can wear it with a shitty old gray sweatshirt hoodie, but beautiful flat fronted pants with a stay crease in a beautiful cut. Very, very chic. 
I, you know, I think people are, are more invested. So I don't want to insult the customer by saying that they're just going to buy the little thing around the neck with the, with the Fendi logo on it. I think that that, that customer is, is maturing in lockdown. They're appreciating a good quality piece of clothing that can just transform everything you've already got. And Sylvia herself has said in the past, she can't bear the eye. It makes her sick. That's what she said. It makes her sick to think of anybody wearing head to toe Fendi. So I, I love the idea that she's presenting some beautiful pieces that you can buy into. Yolo, any looks that you wanted to? Yeah, I think the Power Rangers at the end. Um, I think it's interesting that Puffer is now such a proposition for luxury. Um, yeah. It's always been such a sort of very sportswear, streetwear, um, low brow thing, sort of puffers and in nylon. Um, but now a proposition like this from Fendi, where the whole outfit is essentially this nylon puffer in the full color. Um, and I kind of like how they've sort of cheekily done it because the the sort of the stripes, the way they've they've um, quilted it, kind of reflects how they do the the fur in in those rolls and in, in the stripes. I thought that was really clever. Um, and also the sort of how there's much less fur in this collection, even though it is still there. Um, F Fendi like fur is so important to them. Um, so yeah, that was interesting, I think. And also sort of a nod to that sort of back to the social media side of things. It's so popular to have um, a full color look on social media, maybe in the earlier days of Instagram, Instagram sort of moved pa past that now, but we're see seeing that cycle happening on TikTok again now where sort of a full red outfit or a full yellow outfit. It's interesting to see them give a sort of wink nod to, to that phenomenon. Um, and doing these full color looks. Um, I think also I want to add that um, to this development of sort of modernization of these Milanese brands, I think you have to give slight credit to um, the new brands that popped up in that market um, and to push things along. Um, notably people like Sané, um, who have sort of invented a new idea of what Milanese fashion is. Um, I think that's sort of rubbed off on the other um, brands and houses in Milan. Yeah, well, I, I agree. There's sort of something really um, fresh coming out of Milan. Um, look number 11 as well is, is, is interesting with, um, it's, a, it's a knitted uh, dungaree and a top. Um, that's like the perfect very sort of cool lockdown, lockdown style. Lockdown, Steve. <laughs> yeah, that's I wanted to highlight look thirty two as well. Actually, I think it's thirty two with a pale blue kind of dressing gown coat. Yes, because yeah. it almost gives that sort of vibe of you've got your suit on, you're going back to work, but you also still want to be in your comfy dressing gown at home. <laughs> and, and it looks like a pajama shirt underneath as well. So you're sort of, sort of the juxtaposition of, you know, they're going back to work, but having that home comfort at the same time. Yeah. But is, is anyone really wearing a dressing gown at home? I mean, I'm wearing like an eggy stained T-shirt. <laughs> and it's just, it just amazes me because I'm thinking, are any of my friends actually wearing lovely layers of a nice dressing gown, lovely pyjama, uh, uh, you know, is it Olivia Von Hal who does those lovely satin pyjamas? Uh, are they really sat there wearing those with a lovely dressing gown over them? I mean, I, I, I'm not wearing a dressing gown, but I have kind of <laughs> invested in comfortable pyjamas that sort of look good because you kind of spend time, so being in a tracksuit all the time or like tracksuits from needles, um, from the Japanese designers, um, ne Nepentis, I think, needles. Uh, so kind of like casual homeware, but well-made ones. I sort of invested in that. And, and nice slippers, like Gucci slippers with fur and that sort of thing. So, you know, lockdown looks. Um, okay, so we've reached the end of our conversation about um, Fendi uh, Spring, I'm sorry, Autumn Winter 2021. Thank you all 
the panelists. Thank you to all the panelists for joining us. And um, for extensive Fashion Week coverage, be sure to visit showstudio.com. And if you're watching Show Studios on YouTube, uh make sure to press like comment and subscribe below and uh yeah anybody any shows you guys are looking forward to before we finish any shows you're looking forward to in the in the season coming up on your radar i mean say looking Great. forward to prada obviously just happened today yeah i was very excited to see that okay for you yolo um I'm looking forward to what Celine are planning. I think they're going to be slightly outside the schedule, um, but we're being promised another sort of um, out of city experience, I think, which sounds exciting. And for you, Mandy, any shows you're looking I forward to? I am living for Celine every day, just living for it. But the thing that I'm most excited about, of course, is Kim Jones' women's wear um, Oak Couture Fendi debut. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be amazing. I think that's the big ticket of the season. And, and he's he's really um, loving Sylvia Fendi and 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 the whole going there and feeding off it all. It's just really, you can just see that she's excited by him being involved. It's really exciting. That's great. That's great. I mean, it's it's going to compete obviously now with Prada and Ralph Simmons, which I think is really amazing. This again, the way you put it, the collision of two designers to create under one brand, and now we're going to have Fendi and 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 um, and Kim Jones. So it's the battle of the titans, uh, but all in the in the in a good spirit, hopefully. Uh, okay. Well, thank you guys for joining me on this panel and show studio and uh, for all your great answers. Thank I think you. the technical team, I don't know how we're gonna- Thanks guys. <laughs>